Ninus Breachcast, the world's first identity management app made exclusively for identity experts and product owners, is available in the iOS App Store now. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nidus Anarchy Series. I'm your host, Adam, CIO and co-founder of Nidus, and today I want to talk about how Google Research has just recreated Doom in an AI neural network. So they didn't just take the WAD file and have AI play the game. AI has created the game. This is crazy. This is where not only the future of video games are going, but this is kind of like my crazy hat theory of where everything is going to go. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. But first, let's just talk about this amazing feat that Google Research has put together, which is they've made Doom run completely from an AI neural network. So it's generating the game on the fly as you play the game. It's not pre-rendered it's not have the maps aren't made with all the monsters put in certain areas the ai neural network is generating the game as you play it just like it does with with token prediction of the next token in the word when it generates for the llms for this it's just generating the next screen that's being shown so let's just show you how this thing is being played it's pretty crazy so this is the diffusion models of real-time game engines from google research and tel aviv university this is the actual gameplay that you're watching here this is AI rendering frame by frame by frame as the person is playing the game. So this isn't AI generating the code to play Doom. Like a lot of people do for a test of an LLM, they wanna see like, hey, can it make the game Snake and then play the game Snake and write it in Python with whatever. This isn't that. This is generating JPEG images that it's showing you as like a movie as you're playing it, giving it controls. How they did is pretty crazy. They trained it to play Doom and learn what everything does in Doom. When the guns are fired, when you move, when you look, when doors open and shut. So it's learned how to do this. So as you go through and play the game, it's thinking what it should show you. And it just happens to be pretty accurately correct, which is crazy. Now, one thing that's interesting, though, is there is no save state. Because these neural networks don't have, it's not like they're writing to a hard drive of where they are and what it's already gone down. It's just on the fly. So that's there are some limitations to it. But, I mean, we're talking about limitations of something that's groundbreaking. So let's go into the paper a little bit. So the abstract, this kind of summarizes the whole thing. We present Game Engine, the first game engine powered completely by a neural model that enables real-time interaction with a complex environment over long trajectories at high quality. Game Engine can interactively simulate the classic game Doom at over 20 frames per second on a single TPU, which is just like a custom GPU. Next frame prediction achieves a PSNR of 29.4 compared to lossy JPEG compression. So that's effectively that. So like a kind of a lossy JPEG that's being shown frame by frame, that's what it's generating to show the actual motion and, and transitions within the game. Human raiders are only slightly better than the random chance at distinguishing short clips of the game from clips of the simulation. So what that means is they would show, hey look, here's two clips. Is this from the game? Or is this from the AI generated game? And what they're saying is that human raiders, which is just people, are only a little bit better to determine which one's real over the AI system. The game engine is trained in two phases. One, an RL agent learns to play the game and the training sessions are recorded. Two, a diffusion model is trained to produce the next frame, conditioned on the sequence of past frames and actions. So that's right. So it says, okay, here's what I see now. What's that next frame going to be based on everything that's going on? Conditioning augmentations enable auto regressive generation over long trajectories, meaning it can do this over a long period of time. So it's not just generating a four second clip. You can be playing this thing for minutes. So this thing is pretty crazy. Here's some more videos of the actual gameplay. Like this is obviously the first map. I mean, this is crazy. This is all generated on the fly. Every frame that you're seeing playing, even the avatar down on the bottom, we see his face getting all shocked because his health is going down, the, the count of the armor, the bullets that are left, the counters that are over there, all of this is AI generated. It is not rendering anything. It's purely just being responsive and showing it to you as you play through the game. So this goes through the architecture of how they built this whole thing out, which is pretty impressive. The actual paper, though, if you go into the actual paper, this kind of goes into more details of what's really going on behind the scenes, how they did the training, how they built this whole thing out, what's really happening. So it's pretty crazy. So it shows all the different screens of, of what they were doing in different training models. And to show the types of math, because I'm not a math wizard at all, I mean, look at that. I don't know what any of that stuff says. 
but that's crazy complicated. So I hope someone else out there can pick this stuff up and explain it to me because I don't know what any of that is. But this is not something simple, to say the least. Um, now, one thing I want to point out here. Where's let me go down. Where's at the bottom here? Where's the screen? There we go. Okay. So this down here, this the human eval tool that they had. So you'll see it shows this side by side comparison. One is the AI generated game, and one is the actual Doom game, and a human has to say which one is real. And that's how they're basically training. One of the ways that they're training these models to be more and more accurate with the game generation is through this human eval. Human eval, in my mind, is really kind of the de facto benchmark because that's really, are you able to fool a human to think this is the real thing? If so, you get the machine gets rewarded. And therefore, that's what the hell RL is reinforcement learning, right? So you're reinforcing the positives and say, okay, this is the right one. Continue doing it more like this. So in general, this is first off this is amazing and of course they did doom just like everyone they put doom on everything so doom is obviously the first game that someone's really going to tackle with this but this just goes to show where gaming is going in general games are going to be generated on the fly from a prompt not from developers this is where there's going to be a huge shift in how games are developed because it's not going to be writing code anymore it's going to be prompts that are going to be written and the lms behind them that are generating it for you so really the only thing that's stopping the, the, the growth and difference of this Doom game that you see and something that's like whatever the super popular game is now that's out, like whatever the latest Borderlands game is or Fallout or Call of Duty, whatever, the only thing different is just the compute power to do that on-the-fly generation. And like we said before, that's the biggest hang-up for everything in AI is just compute power. But there's things that people have been figuring out to reduce that and to reduce the need of the compute power. Right now, we're just kind of brute forcing. It's kind of like when we said it's going to take forever to crack these encryptions because if you were to brute force this, it would take you thousands of years to get through it. And then all of a sudden, we found out you don't have to brute force it. We could use rainbow tables. And now all of a sudden, we can cut that time down to minutes. So different hacks have been coming out. Like another one here, like hallucinations, right? Hallucinations is something that you want to remove. So when you watch the video gameplay, you'll actually see like some kind of glitchy stuff happening here. So like if you watch like the guy's face, you can see some pixels kind of moving around a little bit. Um, it's not a hundred percent. So you, there are some visual hallucinations happening, you know, randomly it's kind of blurry in some spots. That guy just faded into nothing. So hallucinations are taking place. But if you saw the previous video where we were talking about a whole different way to fine tune your model and they have pretty much completely eliminated hallucinations from this refinement, they, we, if something like that was incorporated here, you'd have an even better game with less compute power because you just have a better finely tuned model for what it is that you're trying to generate. Now, creating a game like Call of Duty, the modern one, that's, there's a new one that's coming out. I think Black Ops was a six that we're at now. Um, you know, the graphics are going to be insane. Gameplay is going to be crazy. So it's all still technically possible. It's just that the compute power that you would need to generate that on the fly is just astronomical. So for us, it's like, that's impossible. But I'm old enough to remember when Doom came out. And when Doom came out, all of us were hacking our computers just to get Doom to run because this was so far advanced that most of our computers couldn't run it. So you had to do all kinds of weird stuff with memory and your hard drive space and just zipping it, learning zip and compression to get the files around. So we had to effectively, kind of like today's overclockers, we had to really mess with the machines just to get them to run Doom to run it, not even look good, just to run it, because it was so far advanced of most of the computers that were out at that time. So if you were to go to, you know, my, what, how was I, probably what, 13, 14, whenever this thing came out? If I were to go to like, let's say my 14 year old self and be like, hey, and show me a video of Call of Duty today, I'd be like, that's never gonna happen, it's impossible. We're there and it's happening on game consoles and we can stream play and play people around the world real time and talk to them. That was before, like Doom 2 is where we had that whole like, you know, being able to do multiplayer but like so but doom was still single player so it, like on the single player side it was just that's not possible that the compute power would be so astronomical i couldn't even wrap my head around it that's where we're at now we're just doing it from the ai side so are we going to have that compute power are we going to figure out how to get there absolutely it's just a matter of time and with all this advent of technology with ai helping us it's probably going to be a lot shorter time than it took to get from what 30 years ago to here it's probably going to be within 10 years that we're going to have this type of realistic Call of Duty rendered on the fly. The fun part about all of this is that we're going to have uniquely generated games based on what you want to play. So we would be able to generate a game that I can say like, hey, I want to play Doom, but 
I want to have it with Super Mario characters, and it's going. I want it to then flip into a 2D side scroller halfway through the game for no apparent reason, and then randomly be abducted by UFOs. But I can throw my Contra baddies out there to deflect the UFOs, and it will. I will be able to play that game on the fly with all that crazy stuff going on. It'll make it just for me, and I'll think it's amazing. Or I could fine tune it to where I have a really cool game, and then just distribute that prompt to my friends or other people, put them online in GitHub, or there's probably going to be communities out there where that's all they do is just distribute prompts for really cool games that people have figured out, kind of like how they do now for image generation. And then you're going to be able to play really awesome games that were catered just to you for the game that you want to play. And we're really not far off from that. I mean, if you think about it, first we had the whole text like the llm i ask a question it generates a response then we get the code responses then we have text to images so you say hey generate me an image of whatever now look at what flux one is doing flux one dev locally can make astronomically amazing images on your machines locally at home we did a whole video about that and showed you how to set that all up with comfy ui if you want to check that out then from there you take an image and you throw it into something like runway ml and now it turns that image into a video and that video looks amazing it looks really good it generates on the fly and it's super fast and it's not rendering it it's generating it right so there's not all that compute power of of on the fly rendering is no longer a thing now we take that one step farther and we look at like OpenAI Sora where they're having full minutes long video of a controlled environment of subjects that say the same, they aren't going crazy flying through the air and it looks real. It looks very real. And a lot of those clips actually look like real video games that we see today too. So the, the idea that we get video quality of Sora being generated on the fly to play a game like you're seeing here in Doom is 100% plausible, it's just compute power that's in our way, and every time that compute power or storage has been an issue, it's always been resolved with time and future advances within technology. So, a little bit of a segue, this brings me to a conversation I was having with some friends of mine the other night, which is about movies. And I was like, I was just thinking, I was like, you know what, like, forget that Sora is going to replace movies. AI generation of movies is going to replace movies altogether there aren't going to be movies there's not going to be movie houses there's not going to be movies there's not going to even going to be netflixes there's not going to be anything like that in the sense that there's not going to be like oh did you see this movie it's really cool that you know so and so actor is in or oh this you know director did whatever it's going to be more like youtube it's just going to be spam of tons of movies and tons of content because they're all going to be just prompts that generate the movie that you watch and you just download the prompt and you put it into your AI video generating thing on the TV that's going to the cloud that's going to stream in real time this movie being generated strictly from a prompt. And it's going to be so much fun because you will be able to make the movie that you want to watch and watch it in real time and have it be the exact same quality as like the latest Marvel Avengers movie that's coming out. That's the level of craziness that we're going to get to. And it's not far. I mean... People are saying less than 10 years. I am I bet you're going to start seeing beta versions of this in less than three years. Where you're like, hey, I want to watch a comedy sci-fi film that has action like a Marvel Avengers movie. But the drama of Benjamin Button. I don't know why it's in my movie. And I want the soundtrack to be um, ICP. <laughs> and, you know, it's like you, you'll be able to say... All, as, as simple of a prompt as just that and go into amazing detail. You can give it an entire storyline and then feed it into that prompt and then it will generate that video for you and you'll be watching that movie live, right? So it's not like you're going to have to sit there and type the prompt, wait for the whole movie to be generated and then watch the movie. It will just like we were showing with the audio, right? So the that um, Suno.com where it generates audio and you just put it in there and it makes, a mu makes music for you. What it does is as soon as it's ready, it will start streaming. And as it's streaming, it will just be continuously generating on the fly. So you'll be able to basically say, hey, here's a prompt. And then instantly, that movie is going to start streaming to you in real time being generated on the fly. So what you're going to see is not movies being shared everywhere to watch and paying tickets to go see it. What you're going to see is just prompts being tailored around. Be like, hey, look, if you throw this prompt into here with this AI image movie generating tool, whatever you're going to be able to see this movie and then people will record them and then put them online for others to share. Like, Hey, check out this cool movie that I made and it's going to be amazing. So you will be able to be the next future director, producer, movie star. You can put yourself in the movies. How rad is that going to be? Then would you take this and tie it into, Oh, well, where are we going to be with AR and VR? 
well, that's going to be exciting too, right? So now you're going to have real-time movie generation of a movie you want in as much detail or as little detail as you want with a headset where you can watch it in real time as if you're in the movie and you can even make yourself the action star of the movie. Now, if we com combine that with what we just saw in Doom, which is the video game being generated frame after frame, but there's one key thing here. There's a player of that game, right? So there's someone controlling Doom Guy to run around and shoot things and go through the walls and find the keys. Add that to real-time movie generation of a prompt you give it. So now you're not just watching a movie. You are the movie. You have your VR goggles on. You're interacting with the movie that's happening. As you turn to look over here, it's generating what it thinks should go there. You move your arm up this way to do something, to grab an apple off a tree, and it apple comes off into your hand. You try. You have a blaster and you start shooting. You can now be a part of these crazy films that you're making. So I don't think we're going to have necessarily just a complete replacement of the movie industry. We're going to have a completely new genre of entertainment, which is going to be interactive video games and movies melded together. So you want to watch a movie, you can sit there and watch it, or you can also choose to interact with it. Almost like kind of like a Ready Player One, but you get to determine what it is that you want to watch and what you do. Things are going to be so crazy and so much fun coming up here soon once we get this compute power thing figured out that it's going to destroy industries, but it's going to create an entire new world of creative projects. The only thing is that kind of scares me, though, is that it's going to further dumb down everyone in the world. So to get where we are now, right, to have these amazing movies that we all know and love, we had people that dedicated their lives into just lighting. We've had people that dedicated everything that they do into CG to create models, 3D models that look cool. Artists that generate the characters and the landscapes and the storylines. And people have been, you know, just that their lives have been poured into just creating this one script for a movie. And it's so great and it's so amazing because of the creativeness that they put in there. So AI, as of right now and for, for a while, it will not be able to create anything new. It will only be able to learn what is already out there. So if you're like, hey, I want to play a Western game or watch a Western movie, it can do that because Westerns exist. But that whole something new aspect, it can't do. So that's where we're going to need people to keep creating new things, but you're not going to really be incentivized anymore. Like, why would you dedicate your life to doing something if AI is just going to rip it off and steal it and you lose it all? It doesn't make any sense. So we're going to have a severe brain drain because also, people have to learn crazy amounts of code and de development to build video games. People have to spend their lives to become like these amazing directors and make all these other movies to learn all the nuances and working with actors and real people and everything. So it's like, and these artists and the, and the creative writers, like they've spent all this time to learn how to create and develop these new artistic mediums. And then AI just rips it off instantly. So what's going to happen next? Is anyone going to spend their life learning how to write the best screenplay or art and character art and development when it's just going to be consumed and then they get no credit and it's taken from them? This is where I think there's going to be a huge debate. But debate or not, it's coming. It's going to happen. It's all going to be replaced. The question is, how are we going to get new content? How are we going to get new art? How are we going to get that new, not just necessarily like from a graphic standpoint, but just art in general, any, any form of an artistic expression of a new thought, how are we going to get that? They're going to be closely held regarded secrets. And maybe that's kind of where the movie industries and the new industries are going to be is it's just that they hire all the smart people to come up with these new creatives, but they're somehow locked down so no one else can get it. How that's going to happen, I have no idea. So there's a Japanese term, ikigai, which means when someone dedicates their life to learning and honing one craft where they're just the complete expert. Like you hear the people like the katanas, right? They make the, there's certain people that make the best katanas. Well, that's everything. There's people that do that ikigai with sushi, with flower arrangements, with calligraphy. I mean, it's, it's in a whole study that people will spend their lives not just perfecting, but just honing and then passing on to the apprentice of the next people that dedicate their lives to this artistic craft. I don't know how that's going to happen anymore. So I feel we're just going to have everyone living off of what we've kind of already created to this point. And that's going to be like 90% of everything out there is just rehash stuff that already exists. But new creative artistic expression, I think, is going to become more rare, which to me is kind of a downside because that's really what 
is enticing about a good movie is that someone has come up with an amazing cool storyline that you know i didn't think of with oh look at that twist no one saw that coming and it makes it all exciting right or you know some a painting just on your wall and they've come up with a new form or a new way like look at alex gray and his crazy obviously tied in with psychedelics but that's a whole new form of art or hr giger one of my favorite artists with just these artistic expressions they we need to figure out a way to save them and encourage more people to keep generating new types of artistic content in all variations of platforms one, so that AI can steal it and rip it off. But two, we got to figure out how to reward them so it still makes it worthwhile. How to do that, I don't know. But the future is going to be crazy. Movies and video games are going to be mind-blowingly awesome. We're about to see a wave of some really cool shit coming up. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you're in the artistic side of the world of any of this stuff, I'd love to hear what are you seeing? What are the rumblings in your community, like within your industry? What are people talking about? And not just like, oh, I want to preserve the right to my face, but like, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, when we're at this level, like we're talking about now, where are you, where are you guys going to be? How do you protect your industry? How do you protect your creative rights? I would love to know if you're, if you're part of that industry in, in any way, shape or form, I'd love to talk to you and get your opinions on it because it's going to happen. And I think that conversation really needs to start now. And, uh, and we need to start having that conversation about what's going to happen a lot later from now and not just what's happening right now, because right now is already over. Like people that were trying to protect their faces a year ago, too late. It's gone. We need to think protections from a lot more of a larger perspective. And uh, I don't know how to do that, but I'm really curious to see if you do. So if you have any ideas, let me know. I'll see you around. Bye. Nidus has just created the first iOS app made exclusively for identity management professionals. It's called Nidus Breachcast, and you can download it now. It's amazing. We have real-time updates of all the latest breaches that are occurring, CVEs as they come out real-time, really pertaining just to identity management. We have media that's going on this podcast. We're going to be bringing in a lot more others as well. And we even have a complete vendor list of all the identity management vendors and all their products. So you can find out exactly where to download their software, all the documentation. And what's even more awesome is an identity management glossary. All those crazy words and acronyms that we can never remember, they're all listed in there for you. No ads, just pure information to make your life simple. We'll